I want to continue on with the fundamental theorem. Maybe we'll start the next section too. We certainly will finish it. Um, but the textbook has something called the net gain theorem. And the so called net change theorem is a little odd in the following sense. The net change theorem says that capital F of B minus capital F of A is the integral from A to B of F prime of X dx. And the reason I said so called, and the reason I called the net change theorem odd, is that the net change theorem is just the fundamental theorem of calculus. Part two. So it's a little weird to have um, to have this theorem and to present it twice. First, calling it the fundamental theorem, then calling it the net change theorem. But the reason the author is doing this is that the author is trying to help you sort of conceptualize what the fundamental theorem is having to do. I mean, beyond the mere fact that it can be used as an integration technique, This f of b minus f of a is the net change of the function capital F on the interval from a to b. I mean, if here's a and here's b, and we have our function, capital F of X. I mean, just to make sure we're on the same page here, the net change is the difference between where we started and where we ended up in terms of Y. So we started down here, we ended up up here, and the difference between that starting and ending value is the net change. So the fundamental theorem of calculus is making a statement about the net change of this function, the net change of capital F. <laughs> Let's go back was slightly banal, but very easy to understand example. We've looked at many times before. The velocity function. I keep saying that the area under a velocity function is the distance that the object travels as long as the velocity function is positive. I keep throwing in that condition that the velocity function should be positive. Let's now investigate this using the net change theorem and using the fact that the velocity is a derivative. The velocity is the derivative of the position your um, function. Then the net 
change theorem says that S of B minus S of A is the integral from A to B of V of T dt. I mean, if I wrote, if I wrote S prime of T here, this would literally be what I have written here, except instead of capital F, I have S. I'm calling my function something different. But I am using the fact that the derivative of the position is the velocity to write to this instead. And this equality doesn't have any requirements as far as velocity being positive. This equality is just the net change theorem, just in scare quotes, it's always true. And what is the net change? S of B minus S of A. It is the displacement of the object. So drawing a picture in two dimensional space, because I think it's easier to draw a picture in two dimensional space. Here's our position initially at time t equals a. And our position changes and we move around and maybe here is where we end up at time t equals b. So what the fundamental theorem or the net change theorem is giving you is the distance between where you started and where you concluded. That is the displacement. And here the velocity isn't always positive. And you'll see that the displacement is not just the distance that we traveled. Um, we traveled a much larger distance than this little line segment would suggest. So, Say we're given a velocity function and velocity isn't always positive. Let's say an object is launched into the air and then falls down and its velocity is 160 minus 32t. I usually end up using meters, but here this is in feet per second. Let's find the integral from zero to eight of V of T D T. <laughs> And I mean, that's something we could have done yesterday. More to the point, let's interpret that integral. So 
This is, I mean, finding the integral is going to just be an antiderivative problem, just in scare quotes as always. Let's start by interpreting it, because I mean, we basically have done this work. So this can be done very quickly. We've already said that the integral of the velocity is the displacement. So as far as interpreting this goes, this is the displacement of the launched object. But we in the moment of launch and the eighth second. <laughs> and that velocity can be negative. So this is different from being the distance that the object travels. I mean, just to make sure, well, I don't know why we would be on the same page. So let me make sure we are. The image here, I mentioned launching an object. The object is going to go up. And while the object is going up, its velocity will be positive. And then the object will fall. And when the object is falling, its velocity will be negative. So that's why I say that velocity doesn't have to be positive here. To find the displacement, the integral from zero to eight of uh, 160 minus 32t dt. So there was some hesitation finding antiderivatives yesterday. You'll be getting more practice with this week's quiz, but the antiderivative of 160 is 160t. T is a power function. T is t to the first. So when we when we take its antiderivative, that one bumps up the two, and we divide by that new power. And we're evaluating from zero to eight. And it doesn't super matter about simplifying because we're going to do this in our calculator and our calculator will not care whether what we put into it is simplified or not, but 32 over two is 16. So let's take going to the calculator as an excuse for a quick breather. Does anybody have any questions about the material so far? Then here we are. So one sixty times eight minus sixteen times eight squared. The short term memory of a goldfish, but that's right. Where 
thugging this eight in. And I mean, we can thug. I mean, you might just notice, I mean, 160 times zero is zero. 16 times zero is also zero. So subtracting zero isn't going to do anything. But since this is still an earthy example, we'll plug it all in. And we will press enter. And we find the displacement of this object is 256 feet. And just to remind ourselves of what this means, the object is going up, the object is going down, this 256 is not the total distance the object travels, it's the difference between where it began and where it's ended up. This is slightly a decor from the net change theorem, but I think after we've said all of that, it's a perfectly natural question. Okay. So what is the total distance of an object? If we have the velocity and we want to know the total distance, how do we do that? And I'll give the answer and then I'll talk about it. I'll have several things to say about it. The velocity on total distance an object travels is the integral of the absolute value of the velocity. Why is that though? Well, say that we have a velocity function. And it's sometimes positive and it's sometimes negative. Then, and say that we have, you know, since we've just followed this example, say that we have something that's moving vertically, <laughs> going up, going down. Well, the area. The positive area under a curve is giving the objects upwards distance. The negative area under the curve is giving the objects downwards distance. So if we didn't if we didn't have that absolute value, we'd have an upwards motion. And then we'd have a downwards motion. And the upwards and downwards motion would partially cancel each other out. And without the absolute value, 
we would wind up with the displacement. We're going to erase some stuff. Does everybody have this copied down? Let's put in the absolute value. That's going to make R come fast. Okay, well, let's, uh, that's going to make It's something like this. So if we get rid of the absolute value, that's going to make this negative part of the curve positive. So now, instead of having upwards and downwards distance, we have this sort of upwards movement. And then we have that upwards movement. There are no negative signs. So instead of canceling, these two movements add together. And instead of having the Basement, we wind up with the total distance. This provides a very useful um, application of a rule that we put on the board a few days, maybe last week, I don't know, but a few days ago, and then haven't used since. Suppose that we want the total distance of an object. So let's go ahead and just keep this example. We've got this object being launched up. We're interested in the time between zero and eight seconds. We want to find the total distance that this object moves. Well, writing the formula down, is no problem. 160 minus 32G BT. Let me exaggerate the absolute values so they don't look like ones. And now we've got a problem because we're really very limited in the antiderivatives we can take. We can take the antiderivatives of polynomials, of a few trig functions. We do not have any antiderivatives that are going to help us with that absolute value. But we do have a trick that I said we can use when we have a piecewise defined function. What I said was that if we have a piecewise defined function, I said this before we knew how to take any antiderivatives, but I said, okay, just cut the interval you're interested in into these pieces. And then you can evaluate each of these integrals separately. You can use 
the fundamental theorem to find that. And you can use the fundamental theorem to find that. And then you can add those up. If this isn't the obvious trick to use, it's probably because we're not necessarily used to thinking about absolute value as being a piecewise divide. I mean, the absolute value just gets rid of any negative signs. What are the pieces here? But the absolute value is a piecewise defined function. It's x when x is non negative and it's negative x when x is negative because remember that the piece um the absolute value makes something positive taking a negative number and multiplying it by negative one will cancel the negative signs and make the result positive so The absolute value of 160 minus 32 T is 16. I'm going to need more room. So the absolute value of 160 minus 32 T is 160 minus 32 T as long as 160 minus 32 T is greater than or equal to zero and it's 32t minus 160 if the opposite holds, if this is negative. Good so far, or does anybody have any questions? So what is the dividing line here? 160 minus 32 T is greater than or equal to zero if 160 is greater than or equal the 32 T if 160 over 32 is greater than or equal to T. So we solve this inequality. Um, the only thing to remember about solving inequalities is that if you ever happen to multiply or divide both sides by a negative number, that would flip the direction of the inequality. But there are no negative numbers here. So we divide it by 32. 32 is positive. Why 
160 divided by 32. You can always tell a problem has been designed for the classroom when you get these nice whole numbers at t equals five. So, between zero and five, this um, velocity is 160 minus 32t. And then, I mean, this is true if t is negative also. This, this is zero is just coming from the fact that in this problem, t is never less than zero. Likewise, this is true if t is 10 or a million, but we're only interested in going up to eight. And now, let me see, I seem to have erased all the stuff with piecewise defined functions. But the rule I'm using here is that if we've got an integral from zero to eight, and we've got some number between zero and eight, say five, then the integral from zero to eight, I'm gonna be sloppy with my notation here, is the integral from zero to five, plus the integral from five to eight. We can break integrals up in this way. So the integral from zero to eight of the absolute value of 160 minus 32t dt is the integral from zero to five of this absolute value thus the integral from five to eight of this absolute value being a little sloppy and dropping the dt on that last integral just because i'm out of space And now from zero to five, the absolute value is this. And all we need to do is get rid of those absolute value signs. From five to eight, the absolute value is that but these are both integrals we can find i mean i know the fundamental theorem is still new to everyone so i'm not going to make any statements about finding them easily but we can use the fundamental theorem as long as we have derivatives we can take and polynomial antiderivatives we can take and polynomials we can anti-differentiate. 
Um, we always can just bump the powers up and divide by the new powers. Uh, this example is turning into something of a march, isn't it? But the integral from zero to five of 160 minus 132 T. Equals. Okay, antiderivative of 160 is 162 minus 32 over 2. We've done this antiderivative before, so I'm going a little quickly through it this time. Evaluated from zero to five. <sighs> so one sixty times five minus minus. 16 times, we could presumably square five in our heads, but one, um, 16 minus five squared minus, and then we either realize that this is zero or we don't. I mean, the only harm of not realizing it's a zero is that you type a few buttons, you didn't press a few buttons, you didn't need to. 400 feet. Looking for the share button, here it is. So this is the positive distance. This is the distance that the object goes up vertically. Now the object is going to start falling and we're going to get that negative distance as well. The integral from five to eight of thirty two t minus one sixty t t and The antiderivative, let me separate these so they don't blend together. The antiderivative is about the same. We plug in eight, we plug in five, we subtract. And people, I mean, I do think you probably need to you know, do the quizzes, you know, get more experience. But when I'm taking these antiderivatives, are people understanding this? I mean, I don't want to like be doing this and then discover no one is following me, but I'm seeing some nods. So I'll take those at face value. So, let me drop this in my notebook so I'm not constantly flipping back and forth. Okay. 
Okay, so when we plug in eight, we've got 16 times 64. I mean, with these numbers, we could just do a lot of this in our head, but we plug in eight, and then we plug in five, 16 times 25 minus 160 times 5, 144. So, 544. Compare that to the displacement where the vertical distance on um, the positive vertical distance and the negative vertical distance add it, um, canceled out, subtracted from each other. Here, we're interested in the total distance, the um, up distance and the down distance add instead of um, subtracting. And by the way, we can sort of check our work here. We've got Well, we don't have room there. But we've got 400 up and then 144 up. So that gives us this 544. In terms of the displacement, we go up 400 and down 144. And that does indeed give us this 256 if we subtract those numbers. Questions. Eight forty. Thought we might start the next section, but if we have eight minutes, that doesn't make a lot of sense. I guess we'll call this here, and with one week remaining, we will start our last textbook section Monday of next week. I will see you all then.